Hello, I'm Major General Janine Burkhead, the commander of the Maryland National Guard. The film you're about to watch, In Freedom's Name, celebrates the military sacrifice and service of black Marylanders throughout history. Whether they were aware of it or not, their actions had resounding effects on the nation in which we live today. Their contributions towards a better world must never be forgotten, but rather immortalized by this film and those of you who honor them in your daily lives. These brave men and women worked tirelessly and displayed resilience in the face of adversity, from enemy fire abroad to discrimination at home, to give us the freedoms we enjoy today. We honor those who sacrifice their lives by what we choose to do with those hard-earned freedoms today. The spirit of unity and resilience displayed during those trying times continues to inspire us. It reminds us that together we can overcome any challenge and protect the values and freedoms that we hold dear. I also want to acknowledge two remarkable individuals who broke modern day barriers within the Maryland National Guard. Lieutenant Colonel James E. Betts, the first African American pilot, in fact, the first black officer of any kind in the Maryland Air National Guard, and Charles David Porter, the first Maryland Army National Guardsman to earn his helicopter's pilot's wings. These men not only pursued their dreams of flying, but also served as beacons of hope and inspiration during challenging times in our nation's history. Betts and Porter's achievements remind us that barriers can be broken when we are committed to our dreams and when we have the support of a community that values diversity and opportunity. They may not have considered themselves special, but their accomplishments are a testament to the enduring spirit and perseverance and service that defines our Maryland veterans. As we celebrate our veterans today, let us remember their sacrifices, honor their legacy and resilience. Let us also draw inspiration from the achievements of our African-American heroes and let their stories remind us that in our pursuit of freedom, we are all bound by a common purpose to defend the freedoms and liberties of everyone in our state and nation. In Freedom's Name, that's the title of a history exhibit touring Maryland. It illustrates and tells the story of 63 black Marylanders who defended liberty, both men and women and the contributions they have made to our nation over 400 years. The illustrated exhibit is big. It consists of 38 panels, each one seven feet tall. When set up on a line, the exhibit stretches for half of a football field. Conceived by the Maryland Military Historical Society and funded in large part by the Baltimore National Heritage Area, the exhibit is the largest of its kind in U.S. history. The history told in the exhibit is but the beginning. It cannot hope to make up for the hundreds of years American historians ignored African-American accomplishments. But it is a start. It is an example. It is a symbol of new direction in history of our young historians leading us. And freedom's name isn't about 63 black people. It's about what it means to be a patriot. It's about us. It's about all of us. The Colonial Era. It's common today to believe there was never a time when the institution of slavery was not part of colonial America. But when Maryland was founded in 1634, enslavement had no legal standing. Instead, all people, black or white, male or female, Christian or Jew, were either free or indentured. If you were free, you could own land, bring lawsuits, and be elected to government. If you were indentured, you could not exercise the rights of a free person until you worked off your debt. This usually took four to seven years, but once your debt was paid, you were free. The colonial part of the exhibit has two panels. The first introduces us to a black Portuguese man who came to Maryland as an indentured servant in 1634. His name, Matias de Sousa. Indentured for seven years, 
After paying his debt, he became a ship captain, a landholder, and a respected member of the community. Elected to the Maryland Assembly by his neighbors, Matias de Souza became the first black person elected to an English legislature in the colonies. The second exhibit panel in the exhibit introduces us to a time in Maryland when enslavement had become the law for all blacks who weren't free men and women. After 1665, most black people were at risk of becoming enslaved. Some escaped and fled west to live on the frontier with Native American tribes. The second panel tells the story of such a man, a black frontiersman named Nemesis. He saved the lives of white frontiersmen from being killed by enemy Native Americans. To this day, places have been named for him and paintings drawn of him as he protected the freedom of white American settlers on the frontier. American Revolution. By the time of the American Revolution in 1775, Enslavement was present throughout much of the English colonies. In most instances, those enslaved were black men and women. But as the American colonies fought to become free from England, so too did African Americans fight to earn their freedom and the respect of our nation. This part of the exhibit tells us about the American Revolution. It describes how African Americans reacted to the revolution in different ways. Many American blacks, both free and in bondage, chose to go fight for the British. The British government had promised freedom to any enslaved people who escaped their owners and joined the British Army and Navy. This was one attractive choice for some blacks because it led to freedom and it helped destroy an American economy built on the backs of people of color. Other African Americans fought on the side of the white American colonists who sought to create a new country. Americans fighting the British said they believed in liberty, freedom, and the right to determine their own future. Black men and women helping George Washington's army often did so in hopes their help would be noticed, would be valued, and would lead to an end of racial discrimination. Even though the Americans won the revolution, when the war ended, no big changes took place for life as a black person in the new United States. War of 1812. About 35 years later, the U.S. fought the British once again, called the War of 1812. The war was a rematch between England and a nation now called the United States. Similar to the American Revolution, many African Americans fought on the side of the U.S. during the War of 1812, and many switched sides and fought for the British. You can find black U.S. soldiers defending Baltimore's Fort McHenry against British attack. The British attackers sometimes included former enslaved men who joined the British Marines. As British Marines, those former enslaved men could help burn down American plantations and help free the enslaved black families kept on those plantations against their will. Sometimes African American men were U.S. sailors on ships that fought the British Navy. On one of the panels is a photo of George Roberts taken decades after the war. During the war, while Roberts was aboard the privateer Chasseur, he fired American cannons at enemy British ships. In the photo, Roberts is an old man dressed almost in rags, but he stares at the camera as he stands unbeaten, displaying the same tough attitude he had as he sank enemy ships and saved American lives. Whether fighting alongside the British or whether fighting against the British, black Americans display courage, strength, and confidence. Those three qualities allowed African Americans to thrive even in the face of enslavement, discrimination, and lack of equality. 
fighting against slavery. By the 1830s and 1840s, many people, both black and white, saw that slavery had to end. For many people, enslavement was an evil institution that ran counter to why Jesus had come to us almost 2,000 years earlier. Other people felt that there should be no law that allowed one person to own another, to willfully sell different family members to different owners, and to provide enslaved people only the rights of animals. These people represented many different groups, most located in America's North and West. They joined together to abolish slavery. They were known as abolitionists. In the 50 years prior to the Civil War, abolitionists followed three main approaches as they sought to end slavery. The first approach used the court system, laws and proclamations by governors as a way to eliminate slavery. This was an entirely legal approach. The second approach was simple but expensive. It involved buying enslaved people from their owners. It too was entirely legal. The third approach was very dangerous, highly illegal, and involved helping enslaved people escape their owners. This became known as the Underground Railroad. In this section of the exhibit, we learn about two African Americans who helped change U.S. history and forever helped end slavery. Those two were Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. We learn about the importance of Frederick Douglass as a voice heard around the world in his fight against slavery. But we also learn that he wasn't looking just to end enslavement. Instead, he was working to demand equality for America's blacks. His voice was heard in the Northeast United States and the Midwest. He traveled as a speaker in Ireland and his message was heard in England and on mainland Europe. He influenced powerful and important people. He even became known to a young Midwestern lawyer by the name of Abraham Lincoln. While Frederick Douglass fought a long, hard battle to use all legal means possible to abolish slavery, Harriet Tubman pursued a far riskier and illegal approach. Her approach was the Underground Railroad. We are introduced to Harriet's life how she came to risk her life to save family members, and how that grew to help far many more escape bondage. We learn about how Southern plantation owners fought back with night watch patrols, police, and tightened the rules about who could travel and what papers were required of blacks who wanted to travel beyond their place of work or home. The important message found in this section of the exhibit is that in ever-growing numbers, black people, both enslaved and free, begin a movement to take their futures into their own hands, be it by legal means or illegal. Increasing numbers of African Americans begin to engage in resistance to a system that refuses to recognize them as equals at a personal level refuses to recognize equal rights under the law, and refuses to allow them the freedom upon which the nation was founded. Civil War. By 1861, slavery had brought the United States to the brink of war. Maryland, a slave state, had the largest number of free blacks in the United States. For every enslaved black person, there was a free black, approximately 89,000. Escaped slaves easily blended in among free blacks, making Maryland a hotbed of the Underground Railroad. The number of free blacks was increasing because tobacco was less important to Maryland's economy. Many felt enslaved labor didn't make economic sense anymore and that in time, slavery would collapse. In 1861, time had run out. Abraham Lincoln's election sparked the Civil War. With a Republican platform calling for the end of slavery, 
His election alienated the South. Most Southern states voted to secede, to leave the Union, and to create a new nation, the Confederate States of America. The breakup of the Union brought on our nation's most costly war. Concerned that Maryland might attempt to secede, President Lincoln ordered U.S. troops to seize Baltimore. For the rest of the war, Maryland was occupied by the Union Army. Baltimore's Federal Hill became a Union fortress whose cannons were pointed directly at the city. In 1862, Lincoln freed all the Confederacy's enslaved black people with the Emancipation Proclamation. In 1863, blacks were allowed to join the U.S. Army for the first time since 1820. With the formation of the U.S. Colored Troops, USCT, the Union Army grew by almost 200,000 soldiers, all of them black. Maryland alone supplied six USCT regiments. These regiments and their black soldiers fought bravely throughout the war. Winning the Frontier By Civil War's end, slavery was illegal throughout the United States. Millions of former slaves now found themselves free. Although laws could change overnight, deeply held racist beliefs could not. In the South, freedom from slavery was just a small step toward gaining true equality as citizens. Black people would still experience decades of violence and discrimination. The frontier offered a chance for greater equality often through the barrel of a gun. For courageous black men, the U.S. Army's four Buffalo Soldier regiments provided such opportunities. The Medal of Honor is awarded to a soldier, a sailor, an airman, or Marine who distinguishes himself conspicuously at the risk of life, by gallantry and intrepidness above and beyond the call of duty in battle. Out west, four Marylanders, each in a black regiment, would earn that medal. Each brought honor to the army, his family, his regiment, and his community. Each was a Buffalo soldier. The Forgotten Blacks Trudging through rotten tracks of war-torn bodies for what? For who? The question we all ask. We say black men were there, you say what? Who? From the Buffalo Soldiers to the Golden 13 to Tuskegee, Medals of Honor don't come with honorable mentions in history books. The mystery looks not so mysterious. For what? For freedom. To be man without limits, to be held in high regard, to be justified in just being. For who? For you. For the long list of freedom fighters, for the fight for freedom, man, free them fighters, and say a prayer to God who is listening even when it seems he's too busy. To be justified in obtaining freedom while so many were still enslaved, to risk envious looks from your own and those who enslaved. We made history, we made the way, Black soldier following orders and crossing borders and saving lives of those who would not save ours. The hours of being devoured by the question, for who? For what? Spanish-American War. When the U.S. battleship Maine blew up in Havana Harbor in 1898, the U.S. went to war against Spain. The war was primarily fought in two Spanish territories, Cuba and the Philippines. America's black soldiers and sailors played a prominent role. The U.S. government told the public we were primarily fighting to end Spain's cruel colonial rule. After defeating Spain, however, American forces remained in former Spanish colonies to protect them for many years. The U.S. also gained new territories, Puerto Rico and Guam, as a result of the war. 
During the Reconstruction era following the Civil War, federal laws protected the civil rights of freedmen, formerly enslaved people, and free blacks throughout the South. In the 1870s, white supremacists gradually gained power in the South, using terror groups to intimidate blacks and suppress their voting. Voter fraud to support white political candidates was widespread. In 1877, the U.S. government withdrew most troops from the South. White supremacists regained political power in every southern state. They legislated Jim Crow laws segregating black people from the white population. Black voting was suppressed. In the landmark 1896 Supreme Court decision Plessy v. Ferguson, the court upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation for public facilities as long as the segregated facilities were equal. This policy became known as separate but equal. Segregation became the law of the land for nearly 60 years. When the battleship Maine blew up in Havana Harbor in 1898, 22 black sailors lost their lives. As the U.S. geared up for war, some African American leaders argued that blacks could win respect and improve their status through military service. Some African Americans, however, expressed sympathy with the Cuban rebels who were fighting for independence from Spain. Among the troops mobilized for the war were four segregated regular army cavalry and infantry regiments, the famous Buffalo Soldiers. The states activated their militia forces as well. Some militia units were black and had black officers. This bothered many military leaders as there were black officers on unit roles. They were not involved in combat. Blacks were widely considered unfit for leadership positions in combat units. Consequently, although there were black officers on unit roles, they were not involved in combat. In late June 1898, the U.S. Army engaged in its first major battle with Spanish forces. The Battle of Las Guasimas included three U.S. Army regiments. The regular Army's 1st Cavalry, its 10th Cavalry made up of black troopers, and New York's 1st Volunteer Cavalry led by Teddy Roosevelt and known as the Rough Riders. During the attack, a white officer of the 1st Cavalry, Major James M. Bell, took a bullet to his leg and fell to the ground. Another officer attempted to carry him from the field, but Bell's shattered leg bone caused so much pain that he had to be put down. The fire was intense. In one 50-foot square plot of ground, 16 men were killed or wounded. Private Augustus Wally, a Marylander in the 10th Cavalry, saw his duty. Just as he had years earlier, while he risked his life to save another's. He sprang into action to help the wounded Major Bell. Together, he and the officer dragged him to safety. Wally was recommended for a second Medal of Honor for his role in saving Major Bell at Las Guasimas. Instead, he received a Certificate of Merit for his extraordinary exertion in the preservation of human life. In 1918, Congress upgraded the Certificates of Merit to the Distinguished Service Medal DSM, and in 1934 to the Distinguished Service Cross. World War I. Beginning in 1900 and continuing for the next 50 years, a mass migration of black workers left the South and headed north in search of work, stability, and equality. The Great Migration, as it became known, led to explosive growth in the black communities of New York, Chicago, St. Louis, and Los Angeles. The migration was caused by the collapse of the cotton market, natural disasters, and the economic failure of tenant farming and sharecropping. People looked north for jobs where blacks found work in steel manufacturing, shipbuilding, automotive, ammunition, and meatpacking factories. Nearly one and a half million blacks moved to the north between 1915 and 1930. The Great Migration spread African American culture far from the South and created what became known as the Harlem Renaissance. Black music, literature, and art blossomed during this period. In response to the war in Europe that began in 1914, Congress passed the Selective Service Act in May 1917. The law required men to register to be drafted into service in preparation for possible U.S. entry into the war. More than 700,000 black men registered early on, and by the war's end, nearly 2.3 million had registered. In less than two years, 367,000 black men were drafted. Most served in the army where segregation was still the rule. Blacks were banned from the Marine Corps and from most jobs in the Navy. 
Many of Maryland's most successful black soldiers were in the National Guard prior to World War I. They were part of a segregated unit called the First Separate Company that had sprung from an earlier unit called the Monumental City Guard. On February 20th, 1879, Baltimore's Monumental City Guard organized as an independent military organization. Composed entirely of African-American men, it initially engaged in social events and parades similar to other black militia groups in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. By 1882, the company was recognized as a unit of the Maryland National Guard and designated the first separate company. Captain William R. Spencer reorganized the first separate company as a field unit. Drills were standardized to match those of the Army. Members took their jobs seriously, and community members began to take notice. The company mobilized for duty in July 1917 and mustered into federal service on July 30th. They were redesignated as Company 1, 372nd Infantry by the regular Army, and arrived in France April 4, 1918. Many black units had black officers. This created a problem for the U.S. Army. If those black units fought alongside white units, there was a chance that black officers would command white soldiers in battle. For many in the army, that was unacceptable. To solve this problem, the army sent most of its black combat units to fight under French command. The 372nd was assigned to the French 157th Red Hand Division. They fought in the Argonne Forest, Verdun, and Alsace Lorraine. Winning many awards for bravery and recognized as valiant soldiers, they returned home in February 1919. On their return, they lost their regular army status and were reorganized as a National Guard unit in 1921. World War II. Between World War I and World War II, little had changed for African Americans throughout the United States. Blacks still lived in a racial segregated society and were subjected to discrimination in housing, employment, and education. The effects of the Great Depression were still being felt across the nation. Black farmers whose lives were destroyed by the Midwestern Dust Bowl had moved to the coasts or to Chicago. There, blacks worked in service industries, public safety jobs, entertainment, agriculture, and meatpacking. Within the military, black men served in segregated army units. In the Navy, they could only serve as cooks, stewards, and valets. The Army's segregated black regiments still served our nation, while black National Guard infantry units existed in the North and the Midwest. Despite the evidence of the Civil War, the Indian Wars, the Spanish-American War, and World War I, most white officers believed black soldiers couldn't meet the demands of intense combat. Such prejudices also excluded African Americans from the Army's new Air Corps. Opportunities for blacks to become regular Army officers were limited. Between 1920 and 1940, only one black cadet graduated from West Point. In 1940, the total number of black regular Army officers was five. Three of these were chaplains. Beginning in 1940, Maryland felt the influence of the war Europe had been fighting for over a year. Europe's war required many goods from the U.S., and Maryland began producing defense goods for sales overseas. Thousands of well-paying jobs found their way to Baltimore and surrounding areas. Manufacturing aircraft, heavy equipment, and other war goods sparked employment in local industries. High-paying jobs increased in steel manufacturing, shipbuilding, and the crucial maritime, rail, and trucking sectors. Demand for Maryland's agricultural products and natural resources skyrocketed. Unfortunately, many of these jobs were in segregated corporations and so closed to black Marylanders. In early 1941, black labor leader A. Philip Randolph threatened a mass march on Washington unless blacks were hired equally. He stated, it is time to wake up Washington as it has never been shocked before. To prevent the march, which many feared would result in race riots and international embarrassment, President Franklin Roosevelt issued an executive order that banned discrimination in defense industries. Korean War. When World War II ended, so did wartime integration in industry. As white soldiers returned and took up their old jobs, 
workers who held these jobs in their absence, women and people of color, often found themselves underemployed and disempowered. However, now the genie was out of the bottle and World War II had proven the value of black workers and leaders to our society. In 1948, President Truman ordered equal treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed services without regard to race, color, religion, or national origin. In 1950, the military began to desegregate just as the Korean War began. Because of Truman's order, Korea was the first war in nearly 150 years in which U.S. soldiers fought side by side regardless of race. In 1951, the all-black 24th Infantry Regiment, which had served during the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, and the beginning of the Korean War, was disbanded. This eliminated the last formal element of segregation in the Army. Its African-American soldiers were integrated into other units. Blacks now served throughout the military and were involved in all major combat operations. Vietnam War. To understand the history of African Americans and the Vietnam War, one only needs to know that in Vietnam, as in every U.S. war preceding it, the African American community struggled both on the battlefield and at home. In Vietnam, black service members served in a united effort to stay alive, defeat an enemy, and return home. Their enemies were the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese Army, the climate, the terrain, and the weather. At home, the African American community fought for their civil rights. Although a major civil rights victory was earned by Maryland's Thurgood Marshall in the 1954 Supreme Court decision, Brown v. Board of Education, that did not guarantee blacks their rights. Those rights had to be written into federal law. The civil rights movement of the 1960s fought to ensure that school integration became the law of the land and to end institutional discrimination in voting, seating, washroom facilities, housing, employment, and recreation facilities. The civil rights movement heated up prior to and during large-scale deployments of U.S. soldiers to Vietnam from 1963 through 1968. The leaders of the movement focused national attention on racial discrimination seen across our country. Demonstrations and marches by African Americans across the South incited backlashes from white communities in the form of police brutality, intimidation, and increased activity by racial hate groups. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. It outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, and promoted equality in voting, public education, employment, and public accommodations. It had taken nearly a century, but blacks could now begin to fully realize the freedoms granted by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Sadly, while still pursuing the dream of black equality in the U.S., Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. U.S. involvement in Vietnam began in 1961 and continued through 1975. It was the first American war that integrated blacks into combat units as policy and had blacks commanding integrated units. While for a short period African American soldiers died at a rate higher than average, in general, losses of African American soldiers were close to their percentage of the military and the U.S. population. Of the 58,220 U.S. deaths in the Vietnam War recognized by the U.S. government, 7,243 were African American soldiers, about 12%. Blacks made up about 11% of the U.S. population at the time. The final two panels of the exhibit give voice to the experiences of Matthew Henson, an Arctic explorer, and Robert Kerbeam, a test pilot, scientist, and astronaut. Each of these African-American men was born in Maryland. 
almost 100 years apart, and each of them made history by bravely exploring environments alien to the majority of the people on the planet. Matthew Henson became the first man to locate and visit the North Pole. Robert Kerbeam successfully helped explore space as an astronaut and one who successfully left his spacecraft and traveled in space in order to accomplish crucial missions. This final section of the exhibit shows that there is no limit to what black Americans can accomplish. There is no limit to the success of which black children can dream. There is no limit to the thanks our nation owes the black community for its support and its steadfast faith in the possibilities tomorrow may bring.